Good evening, Fernwood. It is your heel with appeal, Neil, and it's time for us to keep an even keel with another episode of Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman. We are watching episode 263 today from April 6th, 1977. We spent the whole episode yesterday at the Dimes for the Disease telethon, so let us do an overview. Loretta brought us in with a reminder to donate and also that there was a bomb threat. Folks seem ready to go, and Wanda and Merle were surprised at how donations were coming in so well since the bomb threat happened. Then our local white nationalists, Vernon and Tex, remind us that they are planning to frame a black man for the explosion of the factory. Tex comes onto the show to let everyone know that the bomb threat was a prank. Mind you, he actually called in the bomb threat. And as folks get out from under their hiding spaces, Tex uses stereotypes to again insinuate that a black person was responsible for the prank. Merle and Wanda come onto the show to do a skate dancing number, and then Vernon tells Tex that he needs to take care of Howie Freeze. As Kathy is practicing her baton twirling, Howie sneaks around since he escaped from the handcuffs and tells Kathy everything that he knows about the glorious Guardians of Good being a white supremacist organization. And Kathy hides him away just as Tex approaches to find out about him. We see Merle and Wanda on the phone with Lila, who they are successfully driving crazy, it appears. As George gets ready to saw Martha in half, though Mary interrupts it because George only bought half of the trick to save money. Howie tells George that he is being duped by the GGG, and George is insulted on his behalf and Tom's. Then Mary Hartman joins the show and introduces herself and her partner, Dewey, and this angers the bigoted Tex, though Vernon stops him from using his shotgun on live television. Mary and Dewey's performance of Othello is really affecting, leaving everyone impressed, including Tom, who seems awestruck after Dewey and Mary share a kiss in the scene. Mary continues the performance, explaining everything to the audience as it goes, and Wanda and Merle are both really impressed with Mary's talent. Merle thinks that she can go all the way to the top. We cut to Kathy, who thinks that revealing the GGG plans on television would be embarrassing to her family, and she leaves as Tex finally finds Howie with a shotgun and a bag of money. Tex offers the choice to Howie of either getting shot or taking the bribe. Given those two choices, Howie takes the money and slowly saunters out. And as the scene between Othello and Desdemona approaches its climax, Tex tells Vernon that he bribed Howie, and Vernon starts to strangle Tex as Othello places a pillow on Desdemona's face to smother her. And as the scene reaches its awful climax, the donations rise from $20,000 to $25,000, and Loretta comes out saying they've reached their goal, and there's a celebration, and Tex apologizes to Vernon for letting Howie go. And y'all, it looks like we're going to be switching gears from the last couple of days, so why don't we get on the road? Mary Hartman! Mary Hartman! Oh. Hey, hey, Angelo, how you doing there, Ford? There you both are. <laughs> Say, listen, if I could have 10% of that 25,000, I'll be rolling. Oh, sure, yeah. 10% of 25 grand, that comes to, uh, well, that's a straight 2,500, right? We put it away right in here. You know, Angelo, you really should come over for dinner some night. Or, Mary. you know, all of us, all of us could possibly come over to your place Mary. if you like. Yeah, whichever you prefer, you know, any anything like that. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Mary, I'm going to just talk to your private here. Just yeah, for I know, minute. Merle. Please, you know, uh, uh, when you talk in front of uh, someone in an iron lung, uh, immediately they assume that you're talking about them. We'll be right with you, Ange. The fact is, uh, we're short, two and a half big ones. Can I just get my money and go? Hmm? Listen, Angie, uh, how you doing, buddy? I um, wonder if you could just give me a, just a couple of minutes here, okay? <laughs> Thanks. Uh, 
You do have my money, don't you? Um. <laughs> my money's gone? Uh, well, I'm sure that that's just a, uh, that's just a temporary thing, Angie. I mean, you know, who's gonna steal a sick person's money and then sleep at night? I mean, could you? You know, I couldn't. Could you? No. I, I couldn't do that. I want that money. Yeah. I, I mean, I need that money. Yeah. I mean, I made great sacrifices yeah. to come here, and, and I really would like yeah. that money. Now, Angela, you have to be very careful not to get yourself into a snit, or else you're going to uh, put yourself uh, into a terrible state, which would be very bad for your body and your uh, bus. You know, I could sue if I wanted to. Merle, come here a minute. Um, I don't know what to do here. I really don't. I mean, I really did. I, you saw me. I tried yeah, to talk yeah, to him yeah. like a person. Uh -huh. Yeah. What's going on here? Hey, Vernon. What does he want? More money? Ingrate? You should be happy as a clam. I trusted you. I thought you cared about the 112 different diseases. And now my money's gone. Gone? Stolen is what it is, Vernon. Yeah. I am appalled. I demand an investigation. Oh, and you shall have one right now. Excuse me, Merle. Oh, this is very interesting. Uh, Merle, did you notice this large green yeah. object in the safe? Is that a watermelon? Well, by George, you're right. Well, this could be a clue to the identity of the thief. Well, a bizarre clue in a series of bizarre happenings. Yes, well, first the Afro comb, and then the, uh, then the Marvin Gaye album, and then the, uh, the threat from the man eating southern fried chicken and black-eyed peas, and now a watermelon. What? I wonder what this could all mean. Well, Vernon, on them Afro combs, I've, I've, I've heard that they're oftentimes used by uh, Afro-Americans now. Merle, you may be right. Well, this may be the link we were looking for. Well, what if, well, what if one person were responsible for the, for the bombing and the explosion and the robbery? It's a, a black person, one black person who may still be in our midst and who may even have participated in our, in our telethon. Oh, who could it be? Just Dewey. <laughs> I find that so funny. <laughs> I have a feeling the chief of police won't feel quite the same way. Well, good night, Mac. Thanks for the lovely telethon. Go in. Can we lose your key? No, my nerve. You know, I, I, after, how can I face Howie after, after what we've shared together? I mean, three wonderful nights of tap dancing and roller skating and singing and wild fun and juggling. It's left me with this strange feeling. Maybe it's happiness. No guilt. I always feel that way when I'm happy. Hey, let's just go in there and tell him how you feel. It's not going to be that easy. I mean, how can I tell Howie that our non-relationship is over? I mean, I don't know what he'll do. He'll be devastated. Howie. I've, I've got to talk to you. This is really important. Now, I don't know ex exactly how to say this, but I'm going to try and be as delicate as possible. I think that, well, it's over. You see, we're set... Are you leaving me? You're leaving me? How could you do that? I, I was going to send you a telegram. From where? L.A., look, look, uh, if I'm going to make it, I've got to go to L.A., right? You know, I, I've got to move on, and L.A. is the only place better than Fernwood. Yeah, but what about the GGG story that you, the, the whole breakthrough? No, you see, you were right. You were, it was nothing. It was absolutely nothing. Vernon, Vernon in Texas uh, pointed that out to me in a very convincing way. 
Vernon and Texas. How, I thought you didn't trust them. How can you believe them? Because they believe in me. Look, Kathy, if I'm going to have a future, I got to go where the action is, right? I got to hit the, the, uh, the t TV, the news, you know? Maybe I can get my hair fixed, you know, maybe a few caps, you know, I can, I can uh, interview some famous people. Who knows? Maybe I'll become another Jane Pauley. I, I, I don't know. Look, look, just don't try to stop me, all right? I gotta go. Just, just, just don't, don't try to stop me. <laughs> this is my dream. And people, people don't dream enough these days. Yeah, but what about my dream? Don't you care about me? <sighs> sure I do. I... As soon as I get to L.A., I want you to send me a postcard. You know those times you're worried about being inadequate? Well, you are inadequate. Mm-hmm. I knew it. You turned against me just like I predicted you would. Yeah. Bye. It was fun while it ended. Monty Hall, you should be on the gong show. <laughs> Did you see a red-headed felon running this way? Did, does this place have a back door? You just came through it. You better come out, lady, with your hands high by the count of three. One, two, two and a half. Okay, lady, spread them. Now, wait a minute. I demand, I demand to see my lawyer. Oh, Martha, what did you do now? George, George, he was a frame up. All right, lady, let's take a ride down to headquarters. Take your hands off me, you big bully. Don't you touch me. Now, wait a minute. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Now, don't you come in here treating my wife like a common criminal in her own house. I'll handle this. Okay, Turkey, start singing. I caught a red-handed shoplifting at the Federated. All right, all right, all right. Maybe my wife is a little bit wacky, but she's no common criminal, for heaven's sake. So that's, that's... for the judge to decide. Come on, lady. Now, I told you to take your hands off me. Ow, will you come on? It's going to be resisting arrest. Will you give me a hand? Get out of here. Get. Oh, hi, Ma. Hi, Pa. Have you seen Tom? What'd she do now? She stole an egg beater from the Federated. An egg beater? Oh, no, she couldn't have done that. She has an egg beater. Come on, lady. Now, I told you, let me go. You're not really going to arrest her just for stealing an egg beater, one little egg beater, and one little spatula. You're going to arrest her for stealing one little egg beater and one little spatula? Oh, I see. I see the whole department. She took the whole department. See, that part had not been made clear to me. <laughs> excuse me, excuse me, officer. <clears throat> Listen, now, uh, as you can see, that this is a real family problem here, and it's terribly embarrassing. However, we all happen to be full-bodied members of a club that the police chief has. You know... All right, Shumway, I'll give your wife a break. But you better keep an eye on her. Right. I got friends on the force, too, you know. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right, let's sit down. Do you realize how embarrassing this is, Martha? How am I going to go to the GGG and tell them that my wife is a klepto? Will you stop saying that, for God's sakes? You're not going to sit there. Just sit there and let your father call me a thief, are you? Daddy. Ma is a klepto. It means she can't help what she's doing. All right, all right. Let's talk about this rationally, Martha. Rationally? Rationally? 
What rationality is there in this? I am sick. I am sick and tired of being bullied and persecuted. Oh, that is just terrible. And being called a klepto. I have made up my mind what little there is of it left that I am moving out. I am moving out of this house. So you two just step aside. And don't try to stop me. She doesn't mean it. She's gonna come through that door. She's gonna kiss you on the cheek. And everything's gonna be perfect again. You just mark my words. I am very sorry to interrupt your nice conversation, but I have to get my plants here. I am taking them on to a better life. Yes, come on, sweetheart. Here we go. Away from that horrible, horrible man that my eldest daughter is talking to. Let me, uh, rephrase that. She means it. Who is it? Now listen, uh, Lord, if it's you, I will let you in and I will answer that door. But if it is the devil, you just get away from my door. Oh, my door, it's Mac. Uh, how do I know it's Mac for sure? Retta, will you open this door? I got my hands full. Hi, oh, Mac. Oh, honey, I'm sorry, but I, I gotta tell you. We've been having some real weirds going on around here lately, and it's just made me kind of act a little crazy, you know? <sighs> you want a beer? No, listen, I can't stay but just for a minute, you know? I just, I'm just bringing Charlie's fishing equipment back here. Listen, listen I need to talk to you about something. Charlie and I have been talking about going fishing this weekend, you know? Really? Yeah, and, well, I mean, I don't want to hurt his little feelings or nothing, but I'd really like to ask out Kathy if you think you'd understand. Oh, he would, Mac. He would. I mean, Charlie is probably one of the most understanding people there is in the whole wide world. You're going to take out Kathy? I just love it. That is fabulous. Now, I trust that she did get everything all tied up with that Howie, right? I reckon she did. I don't know, you know. I mean, listen, I don't want you to think that I come between them two. Oh, gosh. That's all over before I ever come on no, the scene. Oh, well, of course it was, Mac. No, listen, I would never even think about that. I'm just happy that you and Kathy are together. Plus the fact that it does kind of lift off this horrible burden of guilt off these tender and alive shoulders of mine. What do you mean? Well, I just, you know, I guess ever since you had a crush on me. Well, not me, but Lulu, you know, I've kind of felt this responsibility for your affections. Well, listen, you ain't got to worry about that no more, okay? Because, I mean, this Kathy, she's just perfect. I mean, she's really? a wonderful girl. Really? Don't know why I never noticed it before. Oh, well, honey, don't try to figure out them kind of things at all, because you can't do it. I'll tell you, the Lord works in just quiet and wondrous ways, because sometimes it just takes him a few minutes to do something, and then, Mac, other times, you just figure he must be up there with his legs just propped up on a cloud, just taking it easy back in his heavenly chase lounge, you know, because it takes him weeks to do things. Yeah, yeah, you're right there, but I'll tell you what. Once he starts moving, he gets it right, don't he? Well, hell, he sure does, Marlon. <laughs> he really does. Listen, you do me a favor. You tell old Charlie I see him at the plan, all right? I'll do it. And listen, you tell Kathy hi for me, the little lifesaver. All right. Tell her I appreciate it. Thank you, sugar. Have fun now. Bye. Got to get this door fixed. Oh, honey, uh, Mac was just here bringing your official tackle back. Mac. Yeah, my he... fishing tackle. We're going fishing this no, weekend. No, honey, he can't do it. He's going to take Kathy oh, out on, Lord. A, on a date, and uh, he said he's, he's taking cat. Charlie, did you? What is that? That's the weirdest sound. Charlie, don't go out there. Don't honey, please. It's just don't probably go... it's just no, Mac coming come back, sweetheart. Look, at least get a uh, no, honey. A... It's just Mac. Hey, Mac. Listen, Charlie. I don't hear nothing. 
That's just what I'm talking about. It's just, it's that weird kind of silence. Like right after a tornado, you know? Yeah, yeah. Sure is weird. Honey? Huh? Charlie, that is the biggest footprint I've ever seen in my entire life. Charlie, what do you think that could be? Ah. Uh, ah. Uh. Mac wasn't barefoot, was he? No. Hi. What are you doing then? I don't know. You seem like a good idea. What are you doing up? Oh, yeah. Just wanted to be alone. You know, there's some things I'm involved in. I, uh, I just want to think them through. So what would you rather me do? Would you rather me stay here or would you rather me uh, go to bed? I mean, it's really up to you. I mean, I, I could, you know, uh, stay here and just talk all night or um, look, not, you know. Look, maybe some other night, okay? Okay? <laughs> and you're not just saying that because you think I'm sleepy and I'm doing you a big favor if I wanted to talk to you, are you? No. Good. Then I'll stay. Mary, please, please. Please, some, some other night, okay? Please, not tonight, okay? Oh. Okay, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, well, so when do you think? Mary, come on, will you? Please. I mean, I want to. I want to sit here in private and think about my life. And I know, I know, Tom. I'm sorry. I, I'm. I'm sorry. I really. Am. I'm. So, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't realize that. That. It, it's my life too, you know. No, no, it's not. Look, married people cannot be together all the time. Now, we have separate lives, too. And right now, tonight, I think it's better that we... we're separate. Okay? I still think that I should sit here. Okay, that's great. That's just great. Okay. If you like it so much here in the kitchen, then you, you stay here. I'll go to bed. Don't spill any of the milk on the bed, sweetheart. Try to stop me. 
So we switch gears from the telethon with Mary and Merle and Angelo Bickett. And Angelo just wants his money, which I suppose was going to go to all of the sickness. I'm surprised that no one has questioned the fact that 10% of the donations are what is being sent to the ill people. And 90% is going to... What? Administrative costs? However, Vernon shows up and confirms that the money was stolen and finds a watermelon. At first I thought maybe Martha had stolen it and that I was shocked. And then I realized, oh no, Tex gave the money to Howie as a bribe. More about that later. At this point, Vernon signs the dotted line on exactly the contract he is spewing which is to insinuate that Dewey was responsible for the theft, the bomb threat, and the explosion at the plant. And of course he plays it nonchalantly like Merle's suggestion and Mary's suggestion is how he got the idea. Then Kathy gets home along with Mac and things seem to be getting a little more serious between the two of them as Kathy prepares to finally break up with Howie from their non-relationship. I'm not sure if I should be disappointed if this story is ending. I, I would be disappointed if this was the end of Howie's story. I read different emotions in Howie because he seems a little bit torn about this plan to move to Los Angeles since the alternative was to get killed. Kathy doesn't know anything about that because Howie is obscuring it. And I also feel like Kathy is hurt that Howie is just going to leave. Kathy was enjoying the sense of power that she was going to have over her own life by breaking up with Howie, and that's not the case now. Howie is just going to leave. I'm not sure if things are done between the two of them, and I would be really sad because I was, first of all, rooting for them as awful as Kathy has been to Howie over the last few weeks. I still was kind of rooting for them, and also I'm disappointed that Howie is not going to pursue the GGG, and what that means is that the GGG are completely unfettered. And someone who is about to be fettered is Martha Shumway, who runs in as George is watching Monty Hall with sirens wailing behind, and it looks like the kleptomania has reached a breaking point. The police actually chasing after her, and Martha resists arrest, and George tries to get in the way, and Mary shows up and tries to downplay it, and discovers that Martha stole more than just one tiny object. I mean, shoplifting is arrestable, I suppose. Stealing lots and lots of things is a bigger offense than simply taking, you know, one tiny item. George successfully uses his GGG connections to convince the officer to leave, although Martha never has the handcuffs removed from her. And then the Shumway family sit down at the table together and address Martha's kleptomania, which she still denies. And Martha elevates it to the point where she is going to move out. And Mary responds that she's not serious, but then Martha comes right on out and takes her plans, and that is serious for Martha since her plants are her only friends. Then we cut over to Loretta who hears some rustling outside and Mac appears, returning some fishing tackle because Mac wants to take Kathy out. Of course, Loretta's happy about that. Then Charlie shows up and they hear the rustling again and step out. I feel like there was sort of a Bigfoot mania happening in the 70s. I don't know exactly why Bigfoot was so hot in the 70s. I remember the Six Million Dollar Man episode where Steve Austin meets the Abominable Snowman. I feel like there was some kind of Bigfoot thing going on in the 70s and I vaguely remember it, but I don't know why it started. However, there is a giant footprint outside, just a single one because, you know, Bigfoot stands on one foot. Maybe there's only one Bigfoot on this Bigfoot. I don't know what's going on. And then we get to some division. And Tom, we don't really know why he is feeling what he is feeling. I think not having been married myself, I'm not sure exactly how you talk through this kind of feeling, but Tom wants to be alone for a night and Mary won't let it go. Mary wants to stay with him. I don't know if this is specifically related to 
Tom's reaction seeing Dewey kiss Mary, he doesn't mention it. So it could be anything. But Tom is feeling something that he really wants to think through. And he sets this boundary that says, I want to be alone tonight. I understand the need to be alone. On the other side of it, I see Mary. And Mary is hurt by being shut out. And I don't know how you would resolve that. I, I don't know that this can be resolved. And until we know more about what's going on here, it's really a little bit hard to talk about. But I can see the emotion. I see that Tom is hurting somehow. And I can see that Mary is hurting because Tom won't let her in. I can see that Tom needs his space. And I can see that Mary could give him space if she weren't hurt. So I, I don't know what's going to happen here, but this looks like a pretty major change for the Hartmans. So everyone, thank you so much for watching with me. Thank you for leaving your thoughts, feelings, and impressions down in the comments. Thank you for keeping an even keel, and we will see you tomorrow night in Fernwood.